Rejection, the vein of all existence. How to handle it and what to do when it rears its ugly head. Hey, I'm Donnie Bovine, the CEO and founder of Success Champion Networking and author of Endless Stream of Referrals. This is Growth Mode, a podcast all about growing and scaling your business. Hanging out with me as always is Kevin Snow, the sales and automation tactician and genius. And in this episode, we're going to dive into rejection and try and help you freaking finally overcome worrying about what people think about you. So, for me, you know, it's really, really interesting. I never thought I had too much of a problem of rejection, of course, until I got to high school um, and then after high school and then late into my career. Um, but the, the funniest place that ever popped up for me was when I first started selling commercial printing and the first shit, probably 20 to 40, maybe 50 clients. I was such a pain in the ass for the company because what would happen is, is I'd go out, I'd find a client and they would, you know, give me a shot or look at a, a, a proposal or a bid or an RFP that they submitted and we'd give them pricing. And when we gave them pricing, they would look at me without skipping a beat, knowing that I was a greenhorn, knowing that I was young, be like, yeah, that pricing's too high. You're going to have to do better than that. Um, or your turn time's too long. You're going to have to do better in that. And I was constantly racing back to the office going, hey, we got to do something here. We got to do something better. Can we reduce the price? Can we shorten the run time? You know, and I was constantly begging them to help me get these damn projects done because I didn't understand that I, my job was to go in and sell something <laughs> at the price where it's actually profitable for us at a turn time that's actually doable for our people. And I was proactively screwing my coworkers because I was begging for the impossible on a regular basis. And it all stemmed from, I was more concerned about what those clients prospects thought about me than I was actually trying to be a professional in the sales games and go get what I should have been doing in, in, in the first place and getting the right pricing, the right return times and everything else. And I think this shows up probably for a lot of people. We tend to be a people pleaser with our clients because by God, they're our clients and they're so hard to freaking get. So we got to do everything they want and say and do. So, you know, the, uh, that's probably the biggest one that popped up in my head for me, but that's what we're going to dance through. And just know, uh, I truly think there's only one fix for rejection. And that's, you got to like the person that looks back at you in the mirror. Kevin? So I, I think, especially with newer salespeople who haven't uh, taken the, the bumps and bruises along the sales uh, journey, I think there's a lot of emotional... A lot of emotion tied to getting the win and getting that close and getting the person to say yes. You know, it, it's hard to separate, you know, you go back to that phrase, it, you know, it's business, it's not personal. You really have to look at your sales that way. Obviously, you want to be personal, build a relationship with the individual, but looking at the outcome, you really have to step back and not be emotionally tied to the outcome and not have so much writing on it that when you get a no or someone rejects you for whatever reason, that it, it's crushing. There has, you have to have take, you know, it has to be set up in the right frame for how important it actually is. Are there some wins that are like, oh my God, yes, we got to have it. And you can become emotionally vested in it. Yes, but most of your sales wins aren't. They, you know, it is a drop in the bucket. You lose one client, that's okay. I have fifty more in my pipeline. I'm going to go close one of them. And I think, it, I sure. think everyone, especially when they're starting out, gets so invested. It's like, oh, I got to get the close. I got to do this. And it just becomes when every time that you get told no, it's a, it's you know, a kick to kick to the gut. For sure, you know. I, I just remind me, I had a sales call literally yesterday and it was a funny one for me 
because I was teaching her how to sell while I was selling her, you know, so I was walking her through, okay, so this product of ours costs $500 a month. Could you afford $500 a month? And now I'm just teaching her how to sell because she was really, really struggling with her sales process and stuff. So, you know, I said, you know, could you afford $500 a month? And she looked at me and she goes, well, maybe, but I'd have to know more information. And I said, what does that mean? And she goes, well, I'm looking at two or three other people. I said, well, then why don't we just take the no for me and you go with those two or three other people? And she looked at me and she cocked her head and she goes, why would you say that to anybody? And I said, because truthfully, I really don't give a shit. You're a nice gal. I think we could do some cool things together. But if I lived and died by your yes right now, I'd be a broke motherfucker. And she laughed and she goes, well, I'm going to need some time with it. I said, look, it's really simple for me. Let's call it a no for now. I'm not going to follow up and chase you. I'm not going to you know, send you all these emails trying to beg you into my programs and stuff. If you ever somewhere down the line feel like you need more help and advice from me, let me know. And she goes, thanks for that. And then I flip and asked her immediately. I'm like, how does it feel right now knowing that we got to closure in this moment? She goes, actually really good. I said, right. And I don't, I'm not coming across like a greaseball sales guy. She goes, no. I said, if I were to chase you, I'd come across like a greaseball. But I promise you guys, it's taken me years to be able to get to that spot to where I'm not tied to, as Kevin said, that outcome. I don't give a shit. Yeah, I'd love to help a lot of people. But truthfully, that person probably being so indecisive in a short amount of time is going to be a pain in the ass to try and coach in the first place, try and help them grow their business. So it's a win for both sides of the table. But I would also say, Kevin and I have so much business coming in. We have such great pipelines. We have, you know, so many good clients that one deal doesn't matter. And that's what makes all this fun. And Kevin already said it, that one of the keys to be able to handle rejection is to have 50 plus prospects in the pipeline. You know, have a prospect, you know, a pipeline that's so big that this one does not matter. And it makes it makes handling rejection a lot easier. Do you think part of the whole issue with handling rejection for salespeople is uh part ego? And and what I mean by that I, is, you know, we from the beginning when you enter the sales world, you know, it's the there's this huge celebration around someone getting the close and getting the win. And do you think that it becomes partially ego of, well, crap, I, I failed and I didn't I don't get this um, this reinforcement, this positive reinforcement? You know, I, I, I like that you've reframed how you asked that because I, my original answer was going to be different. Um, but as you went through it, I think it depends on where a person is. So so if you're in a pit sales world where you got a bunch of guys and gals hammering the fucking phones. Yeah, it's an ego play, because if you're not fucking, you know, putting them up on the wall, uh, you're everybody's going to be fucking busting your chops. And it's going to be really, really, really hard to win in that world if you're not not getting closes. I, I think if I took it to commercial printing, it's the opposite of ego. If you don't win, you felt like you let the entire company down, right? Because the salespeople, we are the lifeblood of revenue coming into the company. Meaning if we don't close deals, people don't get their paychecks paid. And so I think, you know, it's, sometimes it's not so much ego is we got to go back and look at our coworkers and go, I didn't get it. You know, and so so I think it's whatever the opposite of ego is. I think it, if we feel like we let them down. But and then I think as a solopreneur, it's validation for a lot of people. I think they're validating themselves by getting the close. And if they don't get the close, if people don't see them as awesome, as amazing, 
then they beat themselves up saying, well, I'm not as good as I could have been. So I know that was a three part answer, but it took me a second. And I, I like to reframe so I could reposition myself. Some people, it's a straight up ego thing. You know, some people are just programmed to win. Like if you're especially like a former athlete, a former achiever, former winner type person, you get in this game and you don't don't get the close. And yeah, it's 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 an ego hit because some people just expect to win every single one. So how do you get past that emotional tie? One fucking fill the pipeline. Have so many prospects, you know, get really good at the business development side of things. There's so many prospects are coming in. Two, you know, I set a challenge to, so every Thursday as part of Success Champion Networking, uh, I teach, you know, everything different, business development, sales, um, and the likes. And yesterday we were talking, you know, a lot about uh, how the business development side of things and how do you set that all up and how do you keep out of your way? And, you know, a lot of people just hate the idea of sales altogether. Like the idea of calling them a salesperson is almost like you walked up and punched them in the face because I think a lot of people go through whatever, whether they are sell for somebody else or they're building their own business, they, they carry the idea of, I'm just not a salesperson out there. And I think if you continue to say that, you're going to prove it over and over and over again. And I said for the people that don't think they're a salesperson, like they're a solopreneur trying to build a business, then there's one way to learn how to sell anything, especially your own product and service. And the challenge is really simple. The next 100 conversations you have with people, ask them to buy your service, right? I don't like closing maneuvers to try and get people to do business. But if you will literally, you know, like, like I talked to another gal yesterday and she's in the hospitality industry and I told her this challenge as well. And she goes, well, that's just not how we do it in the hospitality industry. She's like, we don't ask for the business. And I said, well, that's your problem. She's like, but we don't sell. We network. I'm like, okay, you network. How does business happen? She goes, well, people reach out to us and that's how we do business. I said, how's your business doing? And she almost teared up in her eye and she goes, I'm broke. It's not working. I said, cool. The next 100 conversations you have, go freaking ask them to do business with you. And she's like, why? And I said, it's, it's really simple. You're going to get a lot of no's. You're going to get a couple yeses. You're going to more importantly learn what people are looking for because you're going to get all these crazy ass objections. And I hate when you have to overcome objections because if you overcome objections, you're just you've screwed up somewhere else in the sales call, you know, and I think, you know, for a lot of people, the simple act of asking people to do business will teach you sales faster than anything else. It's like the the. um scientific study they did about negotiation and when they do in the negotiation classes is they had tell the students they have to go to a mall and ask a discount on anything they buy and so it's like they go to taco bell and they have to ask a discount for their order at taco bell you know they they go buy a piece of clothing from like nordstrom's or gap or something they have to ask for a discount and try and negotiate their way into that discount. And it's not about getting the discount. It's about learning to be okay with asking, being comfortable in the situation. It's the same idea. Go ask 100 people to buy your product, and you're going to learn so much and be surprised at how many people will be like, okay, let's do that. So I think that's the that's easiest way to get detached from the outcome is to be okay in the ability to ask and get comfortable with the conversation. So that concept of not asking for the sale just seems so odd to me. <laughs> and and I understand why salespeople, because this happens all the time, that they don't actually ask for the person to, to buy. Uh, but having that be, well, that's how it's done in our industry. I'm like, how do you have... So many things go through my head when I hear that. How do you understand actually what your 
your forecast for revenue is. How do you keep your list clean of people who are actually clients and not? If you're not having those conversations where you're moving the people that aren't actually a prospect out of your list so that you can, and then finding new ones to put in there. It's like, well, we, we have this thing. People are going to come and buy it. That's, you know, my job is just to answer questions. I'm like, no, your job is to get them to sign a contract. And, and I guarantee that anybody who says our industry doesn't do that, your top earners, your top performers, they're asking for the business, right? They're, they're having a pipeline, a process. They're not just networking their way and hoping they freaking win. Um, cause I know in, in the medical industry, uh, especially medical sales, this is a, a lot of the big game. You got to go to the right conferences. You got to schmooze and drink, take them drinking, blah, 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 and hope they'll send you business. But even in the top of those games, you know, they're still asking for the, Oh business, yeah. I, I know? had a friend, uh, his wife was medical sales. She sold drugs to hospitals and doctors. And yeah, she did all that stuff, but she was consistently following up and going to the hospitals and talking to the doctors and figuring mm -hmm. out how do we get this drug in to do as a trial for your hospital, as opposed to our competitor's drug. And she was working the game. It wasn't just, you know, yeah. here, I'm going to give you some free stuff and take you to send you to this medical conference that we're holding and hope you buy stuff from us. It was literally getting them to say, all right, yeah, let's test it out. I want to see the difference between these two, these two items. So I, I think, I think that's the easy way out for a lot of salespeople to not have to do the key task in a salesperson's job. Well, and I, I think there's there, that's where people feel like they're the grease ball is, well, if I ask for the sale, you know, the, the, what if they say no, right? With the what we're talking about this whole episode, right? You know, they, 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 they run this whole game through their head of, of, you know, that's what they don't like people doing for, to, to them. And what I tell everybody and Kevin pretty much tells everybody is the people that you feel like are selling you in grease ball manner, manners, Go look what they're selling. And you're going to find there are some industries that have to sell that way because competition, blah, 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 whatever else, you know. But for most people listening to this podcast, what you sell is not a greaseball type thing. And if you're so hung up with what somebody's going to tell you, odds are you're just selling to the wrong people. Because if everybody hems and haws around your product and service, like they don't feel like it's going to be a good deal or they are not asking you to move forward, it's probably because they're broke and you are just continually selling to a lot of broke ass people. And this goes back to you, why you got to have your ICA so damn dialed in and know exactly who you're wanting to go after. Yeah. What were you gonna say? It's interesting because you're talking about some of those industries. There are industries who had to industry wide change how they interacted with sales and how they paid sales and how the sales programs were structured to fix that issue, to fix that whole yeah. grease ball sales maneuver thing. So, because th they got such a bad rap and they literally became. Uh, the you know, the butt of jokes in the sales world. Yes. So yes, but you know, once you get past, and most of those, they are all transactional. You get that sale, and you never yeah. see that person again. Um, so I I think you know for for us, we do a very much a service based sale. I mine is a service based sale. Um, even products like wireless phones and cellular service can be a service-based sale if you're going into it with the right uh, with the right process and with the right attitude and you can get past all of that issue where it's you're no longer having the big rejection it's now becomes if you do it right it's much more collaborative and the the yes comes so much easier 
Well, and what totally just popped in my head is you take an industry like commercial printing, right? Commercial printing, you're calling on companies, you know, orders commercial mm -hmm. printing. They literally are buying your product and service just from somebody else. You know, and, you know, that sale, most times you're not going to get a win on the first call. Every once in a while, freaking, you know, you'll pull a rabbit out of your hat and call the right place, right time. And you're like, can you get here today? You know, that does happen, you know, but only if you're putting in the number of dials. But for, for a lot of that process, you're going in on that first call, doing a lot of get to know you, understanding what their, what their needs are, a lot understanding, you know, when they order, how they order. And you're just trying to get on, you know, can I be printer number four? You know, can I just get on the list that if somebody can't fulfill it or whatever, can can I, you know, get the call? And I, I, I think a lot of people, you know, look at all sales as that you've got to be this greaseball person to make it successful. And I promise you, if you do any greaseball tactics in commercial printing, you're going to get your fucking teeth kicked in because none of that shit's going to work. You know, all the old school of over wow pizzazz them, you know offer them you know crazy things well if you order today you get discounts on you know blah blah all stupid shit you used to hear growing up and i think that's what people correlate sales to and that's why they wrap their head so far around rejection but i think if they found themselves selling a very high ticket item uh out into corporate america they would see that it's it's a whole different level of conversation and I think most people who are struggling that listen to our show are small business owners and they've never seen a high level sale like that. So they don't have anything to compare it to. They're still thinking about the last car they bought, the last boat they bought, the last RV they bought, you know, their insurance when they bought that, you know, all the transactional type sales out there. And I'm not bagging on those industries. But those are some of the biggest industries, solar sales, you know, roofing. Those are some of the biggest industries where it's considered more transactional because you're making a one purchase that you don't need to make another purchase for a long damn time. And so there's a lot of people that get bad raps in those. And so since that's all they know or seen, that's how they yep. project the entire industry. Yeah, I met with someone yesterday afternoon. I uh, He literally had reached out. He's like, can I ask you some questions about process for publishing uh podcasts i'm like sure no i went into the meeting no inkling at all about trying to close him on anything it was like literally just yep i'll answer some questions for you it'll be a cool quick call um might have a cool conversation and then i can go on and do all my stuff um two hours later <laughs> we've we've walked through all this different stuff on you know on how he can integrate automation and you know how you build a community around your podcast and how, how you do all these things and help them start building this strategy so we're now in talks on what an actual engagement with me looks like and how i come in and actually have do stuff with him um and i was like oh well Cool. <laughs> awesome. Uh, but I was, you know, I had no expectations for any outcome. And I think that's really key when you go into these initial meetings with people that, you know, rejection isn't a thing if you're not worried about it. If you're not expecting yeah. that there's going to be this big close at the end. Uh, that And it because that's I think that's part of it. Everyone has this expectation that there's going to be this point at the meeting where they're going to say yes or no. And then that's the that's the end. And it's like the climax of the conversation. I went in just expecting that, hey, we're going to have a really cool conversation. I'm going to get to share some information from my history with growth mode and what we've done with success champion podcast. And now this one. And it just kept snowballing. And which goes back to how I sell with the, you know, I'm just going to give you all this info that you go do stuff and then you can break things and I'll come fix it for you. But I, w I went in with this just whole total expectation of, Hey, we're going to have a fun conversation. And there was no, yep. it literally got rid of any hesitancy about trying to sell and trying to get a yes or being worried that, Oh my God, what happens if he says no? And it was just, it was a, it's a really cool feeling when you're able to figure out how to make that shift so that you are going into these conversations just to have conversations and just to interact with people and, you know, to be a human, 
<laughs> and act like a human. <laughs> Imagine yeah, that. Exactly. Imagine so, that. you know, yeah. I think that's what people need to do is get rid of the whole expectation. Well, I got to close something and say, well, I just got to have a conversation. That's it. That's it. And, and kind of quote Lori Seitz, um, who has a fine as a four letter word podcast. Sales isn't a four letter word. It's five, <laughs> but you know, I digress. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so enjoy it and, and, and learn that, you can be an amazing, awesome, good person and still go sell. I mean, at, at the end of the day, people are going to do business with people they trust. You know, so so go build some trusting relationships. So fill the pipeline, be yourself, sell the people that you want to sell to, sell the people that can say yes, go in without any sort of expectations and rejection gets really, really, really easy. So... As always, guys, if you got any value out of this episode, please make sure you're subscribed uh, and tell one person about the show. And, dude, we seriously appreciate the emails, the the reach outs, the the messages um, and some of the questions you guys are sending in. So so we really appreciate that. So as always, love you, mean it. See you. Bye.